right. Good evening. Good evening. All right. We all have a good afternoon. It's yeah. a beautiful day today. Just a beautiful day. Um, do have a couple of announcements. Uh, our fellowship is September the 3rd, immediately following the morning service. Then we're having a men's breakfast over at Merlin's. He's hosting it on September the 2nd at 8.30 a.m. Then our EMS safety training, September the 9th, there's a sign-up sheet on the back table for food, so please, um, let's help out there. Then there's a church worker seminar Saturday, September the 16th at 9 to 5. We'll be leaving the church at 8 o'clock, so we'll be leaving here at 8 o'clock in the morning. And um, I just asked the pastor, and they will be providing lunch at that, so if you're interested in that, please sign up. Then our revival is September the 17th through the 20th with Brother Dan Knickerbocker. Uh, let's get that on our calendars and start praying about that. Then September 30th is a security team meeting here at the church from 10 o'clock until around noon. Um, if you're, I just kind of, if you're on the security team, let's uh, please put that on your schedule. If there's a conflict, if you just let me know, maybe we can look at it so we can make sure everybody's here. Um, then the ladies choir, they met tonight at 530 and then they're going to uh, meet next Sunday morning at nine o'clock for their practice, so ladies choir next Sunday morning at nine o'clock. Uh, so please keep that in mind and also check the uh, Secret Sisters table out front and keep the book nook in mind. Uh, Second Timothy chapter one and verse two, excuse me, check that, verse seven, it says, for God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. You know, when I read that this morning, I was looking at it. It says, for God had not given us the spirit of fear. We're not supposed to be afraid, but the, um, he's because he's given us the power, but, but of power, the power of love and of a sound mind. And when I read that last part of a sound mind, you know, that's don't abuse what God's given us. That's right. You know, don't don't be arrogant. Don't be mean with it. You don't don't beat people over the head with your Bible because God has given us the ability to work through him. Amen. So um, and it talks of a sound mind or good judgment. Use good judgment. So if you stand as we um, open in prayer. I'm going to ask Brother Romero if he'll open us in prayer, please. And please remain standing for the first song. Amen. Take your hymnals, if you will. 821. 821. Grace greater than our sin. 821.
may be seated two hymns over 823 sweeter as the years go by 823 Hey. 
enjoyed those songs as much as Nathan did. <laughs> Amen. Thank you, ladies. I appreciate the accompaniment. <clears throat> First Peter chapter 2 tonight. First Peter chapter 2, just a couple verses, a few verses here to pull out of the scripture a phrase that the, that the Apostle Peter touches on here, and I want us to see. <clears throat> First Peter chapter 2, verse number 21, down to verse 25. First Peter chapter 2, verse 21, down to 25. For even here unto were ye called... Because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that we should, and here's the phrase, follow his steps. Who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. Who, when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judgeth righteously. Who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, being dead to sins, should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes ye were healed. For ye were as sheep going astray, but are now returned unto the shepherd and bishop of your souls. Amen. Let's look to the Lord in prayer. Our dear Heavenly Father, we rejoice to be gathered here together in your presence this evening, and Lord, we look for a blessing. We thank you for your word that we can hold in our hands and that we can read and we can uh, learn who you are. We can learn how to be like thee. And so, Lord, this evening, we pray that you would draw us close to yourself. Lord, if there be one here that does not know you as Savior, would tonight be the night that uh, he accepts you as his personal Lord and Savior. Be glorified in all things that are said and done, Lord. Accept our songs of praise. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. In 1896, 127 years ago, a pastor in uh, Topeka, Kansas, Reverend Charles Sheldon, wrote a book called In His Steps. Maybe some of you have read it. And in this book is based on a series of messages that he preached in which he presented dilemmas and he uh, encouraged his people, he encouraged his, his parishioners to ask the question and before they made the, de the decision, any decision, to ask the question, what would Jesus do? What would Jesus do? This uh, book sold over 50 million copies and many have read it, enjoyed it, and many uh, it had an impact on many people's lives. But as believers, we are commanded to walk in the steps of Jesus. We are commanded to follow his steps. And we are empowered by the Holy Spirit living within to follow his example that he left uh, for us. The testimony of the Lord Jesus Christ while he was here on earth is that people's lives were changed. And people's lives ought to be changed when we are, 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 are around them because of the, of the witness of the Holy Spirit dwelling within. His example was perfect. He did no sin, verse 22. He, he submitted completely to the will of the Father, verse 23. He, he gave his life to save every one of us. He gave his life because... We cannot do anything to gain our own salvation. There is nothing that we can do that would subtract from the sins that we have already done. And those sins are keeping us out of heaven. So he came down and did what we could not do. He gave his own life. Who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree. That we being dead to sins. A dead person cannot rise Unless somebody gives them life. And that is what the Lord Jesus Christ did. When we were dead to sins. Who should live unto righteousness. By whose stripes ye were healed. It is the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. That saves us from sin. And Peter tells us. That now that the Lord Jesus Christ has gone back to heaven. He, 
He is interceding there for us, and he is calling us. That's what verse 21 says. Hereunto we were called. Ye were called. We have a calling uh, to follow in his steps. He left us an example to follow. You've probably heard the old idiom at, at, at one point or other. Do not, uh, be, before you judge a man, walk a mile in his shoes. Interestingly enough, <clears throat> before the Lord Jesus Christ comes to judge the earth in the final day, he came to walk a mile in our shoes. Amen. He came to live and to experience and to show us a, a, an example that we should walk in his steps. He, he, be, before he came, he came in uh, to judge, he came in human flesh with human temptations and the troubles that I face and the troubles that you face, he faced. And yet there was no sin found in him, neither was guile found in his mouth. He was reviled and he reviled not again. He suffered, but he did not threaten those that, uh, that, that, that came to hurt him. And in the end, he died for the love that he had for me and for you. And now you and I are called to follow in his steps. Now realize something here. The Apostle Peter is not writing to, to a, a happy, flourishing uh, church that had no trouble. He is writing to a first century church that was suffering persecution daily. Uh, he is writing to Christians. Many of the early Christians not only experienced persecution, but in walking in the steps of Christ, they also walked in the death that Christ Jesus experienced. A very similar one. Um, Peter, the, uh, the disciple Peter, the disciple Simeon, and the disciple Andrew were all crucified. Um, in fact, all of the disciples suffered uh, similar. Matthew was slain in Ethiopia. James was beheaded by Herod. Philip was crucified and stoned. Bartholomew was flayed alive. Uh, Thomas was pierced with lances. James the less was thrown from the temple and beaten to death. Jude was shot to death with arrows. Stephen and Matthias were stoned uh, to death. Mark was dragged through the streets. Luke was hanged and Paul was beheaded. Now, I don't say that all of this to say that if you don't die this way, that you're not following in his steps. That's not my point at all. My point is that the, the Apostle Peter is not glibly saying you need to walk in his steps as he's living this glorious life. No, he's suffering uh, along with uh, the way that Jesus suffered as he is walking in the steps of Christ. I want to see uh, us to see where Peter is coming from. It is not a light thing that he is commanding us. He says it's a calling. You need to be dedicated to it. You need to... Uh, to, to give yourself to it, give your life to it. We are called to follow Christ, and it will take dedication. <clears throat> the disciples showed by their lives and their death that they indeed were dedicated to this very thing, following in his steps. You know, in following the Lord Jesus Christ, we are not only living in obedience to his will, but the Bible says that we are being conformed into his image. Conformed into his image. We've been talking about salvation in uh, Sunday school. And the last aspect of salvation is glorification. That one day when we are in heaven, any who have uh, believed on the Lord Jesus Christ and called upon his name for salvation will be in heaven with him for eternity. And, and when we are with him, we will be like him. The, uh, the Apostle John says in 1 John chapter 3 and verse 32... Beloved, now beloved, when he says beloved, he's speaking to those who are saved. Beloved, now are we the sons of God. We have that position in Christ. We have been justified. The penalty of sin has been taken away, and one day we will be with him in heaven. He says, Beloved, now are we the sons of God, but it and it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him. There will be no more this body of sin. We will be glorified. We will be like him forever. 
And it is a, it, it, it is a, a, a calling upon our lives to, why don't we get started now? Amen. Why would we want to live this life in sin here when forever and eternity we're going to be like him and we're going to be with him? Romans chapter 8 and verse 28 says, We know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son. Are you becoming more and more like Jesus Christ every day? That's what you're called to be. We are called to be conformed to the image of his son. You know, there are times that, and I'm just being honest here, there are times that I don't like the things that God allows in my life. Yes, amen. We read a verse in Jeremiah chapter 12. Jeremiah didn't care for it either. And you know, frankly, Jesus lived on this earth and he lived in human flesh and he went through hard things. And you know, I think those hard things were hard for Jesus too. Yeah. He suffered the things that I suffered. He felt the things I feel. He felt the pain. He bled like I bleed when, when, when I'm cut. Only his, uh, he, his blood flowed a whole lot more freely than mine ever has. He gave all of his lifeblood for you and me. I can't imagine that Jesus enjoyed being mistreated. I can't imagine Jesus enjoyed being beaten and having the crown of thorns crammed upon his head and, and, uh, and being nailed to the cross. I imagine it was hard for him to be reviled. I, I imagine it was hard for him to suffer wrongfully having done no sin. But the Bible says that he chose to commit himself to him that judges righteously he believed that, that, that God had a purpose, and that purpose was to save the world. God has a good purpose in your life and mine as well, and you and I, as we follow in the Lord's step, can be assured that all things work together for good to them that love God. The things that are happening in your life today may not look good. But just like it didn't look good for Jesus as he hung on the cross, God's got a purpose that will turn out for good. God oversaw the things that he allowed in Jesus' life, and he will oversee the things that he allows in your life and mine as well. Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 10 says, For it became him for whom are all things and by whom are all things in bringing many sons unto glory to make the captain of their salvation, and this is talking about Jesus Christ, perfect through sufferings. He made the captain of their salvation, Jesus Christ, perfect through sufferings. God was overseeing the process that he, and he said that the sufferings of God, wherein he showed that, God, that, that, that Jesus Christ had no sin, wherein he showed that there was no uh, anger and, and guile or hatred within him, wherein he showed uh, all of these things, the perfection of Jesus Christ, it says it was his suffering that made him perfect. The perfect sacrifice to take away the sins of the world. And Peter says we're to follow his steps. That's not an easy thing. It wasn't an easy thing for Peter either. If we're to be like Jesus, if we're to ask ourselves this question, what would Jesus do? If we're to be conformed to his image in our character, if we're to be conformed to the image of God in, in, in our desires, if we're, we're to uh, put, put God first and put his kingdom first in our lives, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, if we are to be like Jesus Christ in our responses, in our reactions, in our dedications, then we need to be uncomplaining when God puts us through a little trouble, a little suffering. 
And maybe we need to ask ourselves, maybe, what did Jesus do? What, what did Jesus do for me? When, when we see people who need salvation, it should move us. Why? Because it moved Jesus. It moved him. He loved them. He, you, you know what kind of people want Jesus the most? Those who are suffering. And Jesus knew what they were going through. He was suffering too. It's the poor. It's the ones that are despised. It's the sick. It's the homeless. It's the lame. It's the dying. Those are the ones who want Jesus. And we should be moved for these. Because Jesus was. You know, naturally, we want to be... Uh, naturally, we, we want to, to speak to and... and, and and uh, witness to those who are clean and, and they look like they have some money, that maybe they'll be able to give back a little bit. Right. It's not what Jesus did. Right. Jesus didn't go to the rich. You know, the very fact that Jesus went to those <clears throat> who were lepers and lame and blind signifies that, he's, that, that, um, that he did not select the the what would be considered the cream of the crop the calvinists will say that, that that god has already chosen those who will be saved if he did then wouldn't he have chosen those who are who, who are the smartest and the brightest and the best and the wealthiest <laughs> that's not where jesus went he, he said go tell john the baptist that the poor have the gospel preached to them. Those who can't give back. What would Jesus do? You know, when we're, when we're tired and, and, and alone and feeling alone and the devil is tempting, what would Jesus do? He would seek help from the Heavenly Father and he would ask the Lord, uh, ask the Father to, to remove uh, the, this, uh, this burden that was upon him. And he would find strength to defeat the, the, the devil from the word of God. That's what Jesus would do. Do you love God's word? You know, it's often easier said than done. And personally, I don't believe it was easy for Jesus either. The Bible says that he, he arose early before it was yet day. And he prayed. I don't think it was any easier for Jesus to get up than it is for me. Yeah. Yes, he was God, and yes, he always made the right decision. But he was faced with the same feelings. He was faced right. with the same struggles that you and I face. And it is his example, and it is his footsteps that Peter says we need to follow. So what are some of the things that maybe we should consider... As we follow the example of Jesus, number one, I'd like to consider our number one mission is showing God to the world. It's showing the world the God that saved us. First Corinthians 6 tells us, ye are not your own, for ye are bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are are God's. I'm not here to fulfill my desires. I'm not here to promote me. I'm not here to, to, to make my best life today. I'm here to glorify God and I'll have all of eternity to be thankful for that. 2 Corinthians 5 says, Now then we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. An ambassador who is sent to a foreign country isn't sent there for vacation. He isn't set, spent there for me time. He, he isn't sent there to represent himself or to, to get rich or to represent his own interests. He is sent there to represent his country. And that's what you and I are. We are, we are, we are here, um, this world is not my home. Our world, when we are saved, is, is in heaven. 
It is with God. That's where we desire to be. But, but scripture says we are ambassadors for Christ. He has left us here to promote and to uh, broadcast the name of Jesus Christ. Annie Johnson Flint was a prolific poet. Uh, she is the writer of He Giveth More Grace, and she wrote this little poem, The World's Bible. Christ has no hands but our hands to do his work today. He has no feet but our feet to lead men in his way. He has no tongue but our tongues to tell men how he died. He has no help but our help to bring them to his side. We are the only Bible the careless world will read. We are the sinner's gospel. We are the scoffer's creed. We are the Lord's last message given in deed and word. What if the type is crooked? What if the print is blurred? What if our hands are busy with other work than his? What if our feet are walking where sin's allurement is? What if our tongues are speaking the things his lips would spurn? How can we hope to help him and hasten his return? Luke chapter 19 and verse number 10 says, The Lord Jesus Christ came to seek and to save that which was lost. Not only did the Lord Jesus Christ come to save that which was lost, he went seeking for us too. Amen. That's what we should do. That's what we should do. From the very beginning of his public ministry, we see the Lord Jesus Christ doing this very thing. In Matthew chapter 4, just before Jesus starts his public ministry, we see him going through uh, 40 days of fasting and great temptation by the devil in the wilderness, which he came out of uh, uh, perfectly spotless. And immediately he goes and walks along the Sea of Galilee and he finds some fishermen and he says, follow me and I'll make you fisher of men. Follow me. From the very beginning, Jesus was out there seeking to, and, and saving men. From the very beginning, Jesus' primary pers uh, purpose was to call those that were lost, call people to salvation. He, he, he didn't come to be a miracle worker, though he was the best of all. He didn't come to be a healer, though he was. He didn't come to correct the errors of the, of, uh, of the doctors of the law, though he did it very well. His purpose, his primary purpose was to seek and to save. That's what Jesus did. Number one, our mission is showing Christ to the world. Number two, if I am to be like Jesus, I need to get to know Jesus. If I am to be like him, I need to get to know him. The Apostle Paul said in Philippians chapter 3, Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ and be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteous which is, uh, which is of God by faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. When actors and actresses get a, a, a new role, when they are going to play a part in a movie or a a, a play, they study the person that they are going to be representing, that role that they are going to be representing. Uh, they, if they're going to play the role of a policeman, they go and ride around in a, in a car with a policeman and they ask a lot of questions and they mimic what he's doing and, and try to act exactly like what, what he or she is, is, is acting like. If it is the, the story of a person's life and that person is still alive, they go and, and, and spend time with that person and ask them questions. And they, if it's somebody that has passed away, they read books about and try to get into the life of that person. 
They want to become so much like that person that when you watch the movie, you believe that's who they are. If I am to be like the Lord Jesus Christ, I need to get to know him. I need to spend some time with him. I need to read about him, and I need to read of him, and I need to read his book. I need to get in there. I need to know what he has written for my admonition. I need to discover the power that he, uh, of his resurrection. I need to, to, to discover uh, the fellowship of his sufferings. I won't get to know him from a depiction of some Hollywood movie some, somewhere. It never will happen. I knew a guy a few years ago, and he said that he was saved. I, I, really, I have no uh, reason to question uh, his salvation. But one of the things that startled me was that he had never read the Bible. He had never picked up the Bible to read it. And we would sit down every now and again, and we would have a, a, a chat. And, um, and, and he would always want to talk about religion. And he would tell me about this movie of Daniel that he had watched, or this movie of Noah that he had watched, and, 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 or the crucifixion, how wonderful it was, and how he couldn't believe that this or that actually happened. And I'd have to say, brother, that didn't happen. Get out your Bible and read your Bible. If you want to know about the Lord Jesus Christ, don't watch some script written by the children of the devil. You won't find Jesus there. John tells us Jesus is the Word. John chapter 1 and verse 1, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. If you want to know about Jesus, get in the Word. That's who Jesus is. John uh, 5 verse 39 says, Search the Scriptures, for in them ye think ye have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. Luke chapter 24 says that Jesus uh, began at Moses and the prophets and expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. To know your Bible is to know Jesus. We ought to know our Bibles. We ought to be able to give answers to them which uh, have questions. Number three, number three, I can't be like Christ and be like the world too. I can't be like Christ and be like the world too. You know, who I follow will determine where I end up. And I use this, uh, uh, the, this picture uh, oftentimes. The reason people go to hell is because they're following the devil. You turn your direction 180 and you follow the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll end up where he is. You must make a choice which path you are going on. When, when you drive up here to the toll road, one way goes to Detroit and one way goes to Chicago. And, and you've got to make a decision which one you want to go to because you can't go to both. You can't follow Jesus and the devil. Turn over to Matthew chapter 3, if you will. 23. Matthew 23. Matthew chapter 23. Then spake Jesus to the multitude and to his disciples, saying, The scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat, all therefore whatsoever they bid you observe, that observe and do, but do ye not. <laughs> he, he says, observe, observe the law, but don't follow these guys. But do ye not after their works, for they say and do not. For they bind heavy burdens and grievous to be borne. And lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. But all their works they do for to be seen of men. They make broad their phylacteries and enlarge the borders of their garments. And love the uppermost rooms at, seat, at feasts and the chief seats 
in the synagogues and greetings in the market and to be called of men, Rabbi, Rabbi. But be ye not called Rabbi, for one is your master, even Christ, and all ye are brethren. And call no man your father upon the earth, for one is your father which is in heaven. Neither be ye called masters, for one is your master, even Christ. But he that is greatest among you shall be your servant, and whosoever shall exalt himself shall be abased. And he that shall humble himself shall be exalted. If you pattern your life after someone who is following Christ, not following Christ, you won't, follow, you, you won't end up looking like Christ. You won't end up being like Christ. Make sure whoever you're following is following as close to Christ as they can. The Apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, Be ye followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. I think one of the, the biggest damages that can be done to a church is, is a pastor that wants people to follow him instead of the Bible. Everything that comes from this pulpit better be Bible-based. If it's not, don't stick around. Amen. Number four and last... If I live like Jesus, I'll love like Jesus too. You know, you don't have to look very far to find people who are hurting. You don't have to look very far to find people who need to hear the gospel. People who haven't been saved. Or maybe they have been saved for a while, but they're still not growing and they need that little bit of help or or. or, uh, or, or a training or teaching, whatever it may be, to, to, to take that next step. And a lot of people would listen if they just knew that somebody cared. Just knew that somebody loved them. And that's what attracted people to Jesus. They knew by his words that he loved them. They knew, the, the, the leper knew by Jesus' touch that he loved them. Everybody else was, was like they were following a fire truck. Stay back 300 feet. They wouldn't get near that leper. And Jesus went over and he touched him. You know, Jesus could have spoken the word and that leper could have been healed. But they needed a touch. People knew by his attention that they mattered to him. Wherever he went, and if we are to be like Jesus, that should characterize our lives as well. The Apostle Paul says that we, especially pastors, are to be given to hospitality. You know, it does not cost a lot of money to be hospitable. It doesn't cost a lot of money to be kind, to show people you care. And it's not like we need to go looking for people who need Jesus. They're everywhere. Jesus said, Say ye not, there are yet four months, and then cometh harvest. Behold, I say unto you, Lift up your eyes and look on the fields, for they are white already to harvest. God's plan to reach the lost is Christians following Jesus' steps. Following his steps. Living like Jesus. Showing the love of Jesus. Reaching out to those around them. Showing them the hope of heaven. And maybe I need to ask myself this evening, maybe you need to ask yourself this evening, how much do I really know him? How much am I like him? How much am I seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness? How much am I focused on the mission that Christ had? Or am I focused on my next vacation, or paying off a loan, or whatever it may be. Do I walk in his steps? Do I pray before I make every decision like Jesus did? We need to follow in his examples. Maybe I need to ask myself, if I were the only Christian somebody were to know, would they want to get to know Jesus? Are there areas of my life that I haven't yielded to Christ? 
And maybe may, may a broader look than that. Over the last five years, have I become more like Jesus or have I drifted away? Maybe it's time, as the Apostle Peter says, maybe it's time to return to the shepherd and bishop of our souls. Let's look to the Lord in prayer. Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this very timely and pointed calling, command that you have given us to walk in the steps of Jesus. Lord, we desire that we would be a lighthouse in this world. We desire that many would come and desire to have what we have received, salvation through your blood. Be glorified, Lord, in this time of prayer, we pray. His heads are bowed and our eyes are closed this evening. Have you made this calling yours? Have you made it your mission that you're going to be conformed to the image of the Lord Jesus Christ? The altar is open in the front of the church. You want to get alone with the Lord and just spend some time with him and thank him for what he's done in your life. is open. Would you come and pray? Maybe you're here this evening and you've never asked the Lord Jesus Christ to save you from your sins and to cleanse you. To restore that broken fellowship. Broken by sin. Can I ask you, have you asked the Lord Jesus Christ to save you? Have you believed on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and called unto him and said, Lord, I'm not doing anything good that will get me to heaven. There's nothing good that I can do. But I believe that you came and you died for my sins. And I accept you as my Savior. Have you done that? done that you know that you have eternal what we call eternal security you're eternally saved you cannot be taken away from you is that you if you don't know tonight that you're saved but you want to be saved would you just slip up your hand and say that's me. I, I, I want to be saved tonight. We don't want to embarrass you, but we don't want anybody to leave the doors of this church without knowing 100% sure that they're saved. If you're a young man, a, a man will speak to you so that you're comfortable. If you're a young lady, a lady can speak to you. But we don't want you to leave the doors of this church without knowing 100% sure. I'm saved and I know it. I've accepted the Lord Jesus Christ. Some are still praying tonight. Ask the pianist to play through one more time. Eight hundred thirty-six for our last song, if you will. Stand with me if you're able. Eight hundred thirty-six. Eight hundred thirty-six. Just verse number one. He giveth more grace when the burdens grow greater. He said. Great. 
Let's close in prayer. Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. Help us to draw closer to thee and to follow in your steps. Be with us, Lord, in this week. Help us to have uh, an opportunity to tell somebody about you. Be glorified, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You are dismissed. The Lord be with you.